Gary, what is the difference between radiation, radioactivity, and contamination? We've heard on the news recently that those terms are getting mixed up and, and interchanged almost, uh, almost haphazardly. Uh, when uh, an old nuke or someone that's really been in the business hears them getting mixed up, it's like scratching your nails down the chalkboard. Uh, but really there's some subtle differences, but they're, they're important. Uh, radiation is really what you get when you're exposed to a radioactive source. Uh, so radiation uh, is what you get in the tanning salon. You get ultraviolet radiation by going in the tanning bed, uh, and that's, uh, that's the energy getting transmitted to, to you or to an object. So radiation is just energy. Uh, it can be in the form of electrons, which really are running around all the atoms, and, and that's just beta radiation. And then there's gamma radiation, which we get by going out in the sun from cosmic sources and those sorts of things. Um, radioactivity is how much of this is happening at any given time. Uh, when you have an atom that's radioactive, the radioactivity is how many times it does its thing in a second. Uh, so that's the radioactivity. And then contamination is when you get it on you. So I like to use a, a garden hose example. Uh, if you're out and you're uh, getting sprinkled by the garden, garden hose, uh, the radiation would be the water coming out of the hose. Uh, the radioactivity is how hard is that hose going, how much of it's coming at you. And then the contamination would be the water you get on you and, and how wet you are is your dose. So kind of keep those in, in mind, and, and that helps explain a lot of the stuff that we talk about. Can you help us understand the terms that we're hearing on the news for radiation levels? So let's start with dose. Dose is the amount of radiation you absorb and its effect on your body. The international unit is the sievert, a capital S, little v, uh, and it's a unit that's an equivalent dose. How much radiation did you get? Uh, the United States common term that folks understand is the REM. R-E-M, it's a Ronkin, Ronkin equivalent man. It's a, it's a term from way back when, when they decided what is the effects of radiation. Uh, when you tie the two together, the, the important number is 100 millisieverts, so that's 100 thousandths of a sievert equals 10 rem. So in the, in the United States units, 10 rem is something where you can absorb uh, if you're in a, in a casualty or a radioactive environment that you might start seeing some slight effects in your body. So when you hear now in the news that someone absorbed or received 100 millisieverts of dose, you know that's when they may start seeing some effects of radiation. That's important because when we were when we were listening to the accident scenarios, we were hearing things like 300 times the normal level of radiation levels and exposures. Uh, people were getting legal limit raises to radiation exposures. And you were talking about levels that were way, way below these numbers I just listed for acute effects. In other words, effects that you can measure right away, down in the ones and twos of, of REM, which people get almost on a regular basis. I heard that we've detected radiation in the United States from Japan. Is that a concern? Well, any radioactive dose, and we can, we can talk about that later, is always a concern when you talk about risk and being able to, to manage what you do with radiation, just like any other risks you take, like putting your seatbelt on. Uh, but what was interesting about the detection we did, we've got very sensitive array of sensors around the nation. Uh, frankly, a lot of it was from old uh, eras when we were in arms races and those sorts of things, and they detect radiation and levels all day long. Uh, what they detect is the background radiation, and it's a, it's a spectrum. It's a big wiggly line with all these peaks that represent what types of atoms and what types of radiation are out there. Well, in those, they detected a very, very small peak of xenon, xenon gas. Uh, that xenon gas doesn't come from natural sources on a regular basis. So in the noise, and what I mean by in the noise, uh, down in the, <clears throat> excuse me, 0. 0.000027 which is way down there, in that level there was a little peak amongst this noise of radioactive detections. So yeah, they did detect it, but all it says it was there. Uh, on the, well did you, Ray, did you change your smoke detector battery when the clocks changed? I did. Good. Um, in your smoke detector you probably brushed up against a one microcurie radioactive source. I don't know if you know what's there, it's americium. Yeah. Uh, that source in that smoke detector is going to be around for about 2,160 years. Okay. So you had one microcurie source there. Uh, the, the iodine we were talking about and the xenon, the xenon-133, it's gone in about 50 days. So, that, so what, what they detected, this, this peak, and again, you were down in the 
thousandths or millionths of the level that you probably got next to when you changed your smoke detector battery. And I'm glad you did because you did reduce your risk by doing that, so thanks. How much radiation exposure is safe? Uh, the critics of, the, of nuclear energy and, and of radiation uh, use that against us because the, the experts have determined that there are no minimum levels for exposure to radiation that you can say is safe or not safe. Uh, but yet I drove here from my office to, to talk with you and my risk went up just per mile. Uh, in fact, when per mile driven, and, and I've got a, a number here that's, that's actually kind of scary, um, there's 5.6 times 10 to the minus eighth deaths per mile. Okay, that's a risk statistic. You know, the insurance companies love that. Uh, but for every mile driven, I drive a thousand miles, I multiply that by a thousand. Pretty soon your chances are, are right up there. So you can say that no driving is safe either, and, and no matter what you drive. So the answer to your question is, is yes, radiation exposure, just like anything you do, by the time you wake up in the morning and go to bed, adds some level of, of question or risk. But in the scheme of things, the the statistics or even being able to find that in, in the level of things is, is really indiscernible. Should we take potassium iodide pills? We were talking about radiation risks a minute ago and, and safety. Um, let me talk to you about some risks. Uh, may cause irritation to the skin, eyes, and respiratory tract. Uh, symptoms include coughing and shortness of breath. I mean, you're hearing up a lot of these things in Japan. Uh, Large oral doses may cause ear digestion to your gastrointestinal intestines. Redness and pain. Firefighters must wear full respiratory protection when entering an area. That's not fighting a radioactive incident. That's taking potassium iodine. That's the MSDS, the safety data sheet from potassium iodine. So you can take it in the event of a major casualty, like the, the true explosion of the Chernobyl plant, which was a complete different design plant that was being experimented with. Uh, there were some reasons to do that there, and there was reasons to pass it out in, in Japan for very significant cases to protect the thyroid. Uh, but in general, no, the, the folks running around in, in, uh, uh, in California doing some of those things and some of the worries that we've had uh, remind me of the, uh, the anthrax era when everybody bought duct tape and Tyvex and started taping up their houses. Uh, I put the two in the same boat. Are the U.S. plants safer than the Japanese plants? The lessons learned from the Japanese incident are, are still being learned. We're still stabilizing and, and cleaning up and, and, and a lot of that stuff over there. Uh, we have some plants that were the GE, General Electric plants, that were the same as those over there throughout the United States. Uh, some of our most uh, reliable plants right now are, are of that design. Uh, but some interesting analyses were done back in the 80s, uh, here in Oak Ridge in fact, uh, about the design of those plants and what happens when the unthinkable accident. They call these the beyond design basis credible type accidents and I think I got the terms right there. Uh, but, but I always call them the asteroid hits your car when you're driving to grandma's accidents. That's the level of risk we're talking about. Well in the United States we analyzed for those. We said what will happen when those things when those things go on. Uh, as a result of some of that work, we went back and did some retrofit modifications uh, that we don't right now believe we're in, in all those plants over there and, and our regulatory structure is different. Uh, the United States NRC put out some really neat frequent questions and answers on their web page that go into some of the details that, that they've done. Uh, but we've done some things like redundant power systems that are off-site that can be brought in that weren't available at, at the, in the, the accident over there. And then some design features in the containment buildings to get rid of the hydrogen. And, and you know the explosion over there, uh, I, I got a bullet in the other day that said a nuclear explosion. There was a hydrogen explosion. Hydrogen and oxygen blew up, and that's what caused the, the tin roof of that building to, to, to go. Uh, we have some venting procedures and things that were put in place because of the work that was done here to enhance those safety features. I think that there's still going to be some additional reviews to look at what is credible and, and what can even be worse, which is the right thing that we do. One of the things we do from, from all our accidents in the United States or abroad, we go back and look at ourselves very, very hard, and that's the reason for the extreme success that we've had in the, the nuclear navy, the, the, the space program in the commercial nuclear industry.